you have Harry Gans here. Harry, how you doing today? Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I understand you've had a busy day today. Yes, I have. I've been uh, here with the United Way, who's sponsoring uh, the screening tonight, and uh, they've been showing me the services that they're providing, and um, we're working in, con in uh, cooperation with them to uh, bring some awareness to uh, what the services they're providing uh, low-income families in your area. Absolutely. You know, Denise, I know this is one of the things that you work so much with day in and day out, that uh, 211 number is so important for families to be able to find a resource to try to find the things. And I am just curious, why did you decide to bring that here? Uh, well, we had, I, I attended a CEO retreat, a United Way State CEO retreat, and um, one of the State United Way employees, um, Anita Garrett, who is working with a project called Project Earn, which is um, helping, helping folks become employed and, and become employable, um, and she brought to light the, uh, the American Winter trailer, and then from that at our, re our retreat, we actually viewed the film. Um, at the same time, we learned that Harry was going to be coming from L.A. to Atlanta for an event, and so she she reached out to the United Way to see who could um, possibly with, grab I him up, grab him up, and get him to Greenwood. I, I grabbed him um, as I did not hesitate when she called. Um, we had a little glitch with some things that we had yesterday, but I was not going to let this opportunity pass by with, um, with him being this close. And this morning, when he came to the United Center, which I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk about that and get his thoughts on the United Center because he did an extensive tour um, of our facility, and I said. Did you ever think that you would be in Greenwood, South Carolina? And he said, well, I have never heard of Greenwood, South Carolina, so I'm glad that I am here. So hopefully he knows he's you enjoying know, this time. You know, one of the things that you deal with are situations very, very similar to what is in the movie, The American Winner. Very similar. Very similar. With, with, um, we are very fortunate that our United Way is located inside a a building as the United Center. That is not the case for a lot of the United Ways. I think Harry is really so, um, what, did you think, what did you think, Harry? Well, um, I've been uh, doing a screening tour with the film across the country, and it's always in cooperation with some local agency who um, feels like the film can help put a face on some of the work that they're doing. And what impressed me most was that uh, the entire community seems to have rallied around uh, the work the United Way does, and uh, both getting the building, bringing all these social service agencies into one place, and the building is so inviting and warm and modern. Uh, it was a school that was re sure. redone. I was just so impressed with how this community has, um, you know, embraced uh, the United Way and, um, you know, provided services in a way that uh, people can both retain their dignity and get something they need that would have taken, you know, trips to three or four different places. Sure. That is, that is one of the great things about the United Way. And um, have you introduced him to the founder of all this that made all this happen? We have not seen Dr. Jack Farm. He will actually be at the um, screening tonight. And That's so great. We have to, and he is, it was his vision. It was yes. Dr. Jack Farm's vision to have the center. But he, Harry did get to meet um, with Frank Weidman with the South Family Foundation, Foundation, who was very instrumental in uh, sustaining that building. Absolutely. So, um, it's, it's been a great well, that, you know, that's excellent. And, you know, one of the things that is so, um, I'll say, cataclysmic to this is the thing that we've had, the Salvation Army's uh, food pantry has been down to almost zero. The uh, food bank has been down to zero. They've really reached out to the community to try to get support and bring uh, food in. We've needed more food this year, I guess, than most any year that we've needed. And yet we have an economy that is better. Well, it's better for some. Right. Um, you know, I, I was very disappointed in uh, the president's recent speech in which he said, well, uh, we're going to consider uh, entering this new war because uh, the economy seems to be getting better and we can afford it now. Well, uh, for many people... Did he people, really? Wait a minute. Did he really say that? Well, he didn't say the word, we can afford it now. Okay, because okay, I was going to say... That's what he implied. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, for the last year and a half, if you're a news junkie like I am, Issues around income inequality, the decline of the middle class, the plight yes. of poor folks has really taken front and center. Um, whether it's our documentary, other documentaries, the news, 
And, um, you know, I, I think we are in the process of making restoring the middle class a national priority. And I just feel like we're, we're, there's going to be a national setback if all the attention, both in the news and all the money, it starts going overseas again to fight another war. Um, to me, uh, the decline of the middle class, as President said in his State of the Union address, yes. is the defining issue of our time. And we think it's a, uh, the film has, is on a mission, along with many other organizations nationwide, to you know, help put a face on that, to help lift the veil of shame around poverty, and help create a national will to look at restoring the middle class as our number one priority. Well, you know, when you talk about collecting taxes, if you have a middle class that is not working and not able to produce the dollars, then you are having a tax deficit, too. Exactly. Well, as uh, Nick Hanauer in our film, uh, The Billionaire, says, we all do better when we all do better. And you can't just look at, you know, helping someone out as a handout or as charity. You're actually investing in a future customer who will be able to buy your goods and services. I, I don't know what it's like in Greenwood, but, you know, in some of the bigger cities, and even who's serving the middle classes, their businesses are going broke. Do we want to be a country where the only shops on Main Street are Tiffany and the dollar store? No. No. Well, as, a, as an owner of a jewelry store, and as buying, we buy from people, we have seen in the last four, four years, five years, I guess now, all the people that have had to sell things just to maintain. We've seen people with homes going into foreclosures, women selling whatever they could sell of their jewelry and their fine things, silver, all the things that have value, but they've come to us. And it actually has become our business, Sharp Facets, has become a very depressing business a lot of times because it's so hard to see people coming in and needing money and yet not having things maybe that are real or things that they thought were real is the other issue too. And, and this film, American Winter, it, it, it shows real life stories of people who were providing for their families. They and they were they, well, they were didn't want people, to take handouts. They didn't want to. They they were ashamed. They were embarrassed. They were the customers. And then they the recession hit, and they lost their jobs. And and the, what they went through, their plight to, to they they don't want to be there. They want to provide for their families. They want to be productive working citizens. And and just their struggles to get back there. And this documentary just really shows that that could be anybody and that's what we were telling Harry as he was uh, touring the United Center. We're seeing people come in that I've we've never, never seen, seen before it. who are ashamed to be there and number one we want to serve them with dignity and we want to be able to serve them. Um, but secondly to, to tell them okay we're going to help you get to that point where you you will be giving back to the community and be providing for your family. We're going to get you there. It's just going to take some time but we've got to be there to provide those services for them. Absolutely, and I think that is the thing. We, we have a tendency to lock all people in one group, all people, and we don't really, we have people that have never asked for assistance, that have never wanted any help at all, and are too, really too embarrassed in a lot of cases to ask. And that's why 211 is so important. They've not only been dealing with the chronically poor, but in this last recession, what I call the formerly middle class, yes. who haven't s sought services before, don't know anything about how to seek services, sure. and for some, in some places, not here because of the incredible United Center, it's a full-time job just to find out how to get the services you need. Sure. And many people that are looking for services are still working, right. but they're just not making enough to make ends meet. Yes. And, 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 and you know, I think you, you feel horrible for adults, you feel extra horrible for the children, particularly like in that first clip where the child says that mom and dad went without anything to eat, and sometimes I feel so horrible, I'm, I, I hate that I am here. Yeah, well, most parents do their best to try to shield their kids from their economic difficulties, but of course that's impossible if the kid comes home and the lights are turned out and he can't do his homework or there's no dinner on the table, um, and these kids obviously have to grow up quickly. And that's why we tried to feature the stories of the kids. Because when it comes to the parents seeking services, as we know in the political environment, I imagine in your state, certainly nationally, mm -hmm. this becomes a divisive issue. How feeding children is a divisive issue, I don't know. Right. But um, certainly, even if you think that parents don't deserve help, maybe they have a vice. Maybe yes. uh, they, they took a loan out they should not. But does that mean their children don't deserve enough to eat? Sure. We address that, actually, uh, not address as far as that, but about all the children that go home on the weekends 
that don't have anything to eat. And we have a program here that works with backpacks to send kids home with food. But it doesn't cover all the kids, but it covers part of them. And that's a good start. That's, that's right. a good start. And that's how you have to look at it. Hey, I'm here with Harry Gant, and I'm here with Denise Manley. We're tackling a tough subject here today, but I hope you'll stay right with us. Hey, if you've got a question, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We're going to have a break, but uh, Denise, when is the screening? Tonight? It is tonight at the Federal Building at the Arts Center at 5.30. Come meet Harry, then we'll get the filming of the screening underway around 6, and then Harry will take some questions. All right, you keep it right here. We'll be right back. Well, that's right. Harry Gantz, where do you know that name from? I know you've probably heard it out there. He's a pretty famous filmmaker and producer here. And one of the ones that you may really remember, it's a 16th season, Taxi Cab Confessions. Does that ring a bell? I think everybody has seen that, and we've all, we're all voyeurs, aren't we, Harry? We are all voyeurs, but um, I think that the, the heart of Taxi Cab Confessions was that everybody's got a story um, and everybody's got a part of themselves that they don't necessarily share with everyone, but they need an opportunity to do that. In the past, there's been psychology, there's religion, but some people don't even feel comfortable there opening up. And there was something about that cab that was magical and, and allowed people, gave them the permission to tell their stories. Of course, we had to get the release, so you only seen the stories in which there was a release. You can imagine so, what's in the so, vault. So, wait a minute. So <laughs> that means you've got a lot of stories that never got published for people that said, oh my God, you were filming this? Exactly right. Exactly right. And really, it got harder as we went because over the years, reality TV started to take off and people started to distrust it. If they knew Taxi Cab Confessions, they knew that we were trying to tell their story from their point of view. But if they didn't, their reference is reality TV. And we know how people feel about that. They might enjoy watching it, but they know that it is... Uh, you know, a way to kind of degrade and uh, show people in, in their worst light, and uh, for good reason, people wouldn't sign releases because they didn't know who we are, or how we were going to use it. Or how you were going to use it, I would say, probably more than yeah than anything else. But you've had an immense success on that. Now, I would be interested to know before we talk more about American Winter. How did you get into the business? Did you go to school for this? What did you do? Uh, no, neither my brother and I went to film school. We were both uh, making a living doing other things. We fancied ourselves in the arts, but um, you know, I was working for my father's trucking company for a while, and um, we decided to make a film. Uh, we bought a camera. We had a friend that was a cameraman, and we made our first film uh, called Couples Arguing. And for that film, we uh, videotaped couples in the midst of their own arguments. Whenever they got into an argument, they would page us, that's how old we are. We remember pages. And uh, we'd rush over to their argument and film it in progress. And we shot hours and hours of arguments and put together this hour and a half documentary. Was it harder than you thought it would be? Well, it, it's, um, certainly we made a lot of mistakes because I did sound and my brother did camera and the camera guy was teaching both of us. And um, it's not that it was harder. It, it's just that um, the film actually was successful. It was on um, public television and it played all over the world and it still is used in uh, counseling um, in teaching counselors. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave us the false impression that this documentary film business was easier, easy and uh, it was a lot harder to raise money uh, as we went and you know, basically it was very slim pickings between that film and when we hit with Taxi Cab Confessions. Wow. So, um so you have, you have made these films, you've done this. I would be uh, curious as to what made you decide to do American Winter? Well, um, as the Great Recession took hold, we looked around and, you know, the, the thing about the recession is, is that everybody knows somebody who was hit by it. Everybody knows somebody who lost their house. Everybody knows somebody who was evicted or lost their job or had some medical issue that turned them into, uh, you know, went down a few socioeconomic on the ladder. And uh, we looked around at the films that were being made, and most of them were about the causes of the Great Recession, but there was very little about the human toll. And that's sort of our expertise, following, you know, real life, especially around relationships in a very authentic way, and trying to get the personal stories. And um, we read an article in the uh, LA Times about 211. Like most people, middle class and above, we didn't know what 211 was. Uh, we, the article is specifically about this wave of poverty and the increased call volume of 211 
in Orange County, which was known as being a bastion of wealth, and certainly there was this underbelly of, of poverty. So they invited us down, we listened in on some calls, and we were convinced this is the, is the center of the emotional toll that it's taken on families. And, and we finally found a 211 uh, organization in Portland, Oregon, who allowed us to camp out there in their uh, 211 office, listen in on calls, and we found all of our subjects through the 211 by asking some of them if we'd be willing to participate in the documentary. What was what? What did people feel about the documentary? The people that you were wanting to film, what did they feel? Well, um, uh, you know, as part of the media, I'd say the shaming of the poor has been one of our biggest sins over the past 40, 40 years. Um, uh, there has been uh, a script in the media that uh, it's your fault, and uh, there's the givers and the takers. There's the welfare clean queens, and there's the people who work for a living. And uh, we found that that really was a myth. Yes, there's fraud in the system, but the majority of the people who were seeking services at 211 wanted nothing more to get the services and get back on their feet as quickly as possible. The shaming of the poor has created you know, a lot of angst. It's not just that you're poor and all the stresses that go with it, but nobody wants to tell their friends that they're in that situation. There's so much shame associated with it. So it was hard to get people to participate. And I think the ones that did felt the value in showing this so it could help to lift that veil of shame. And I think that was, in terms of their particular experience, um, happened in the screening, uh, in the opening that was at the Portland Interla International Film Festival when all the families showed up. They all lined up at the end of the screening and got a standing ovation. And that, to us, was sort of symbolic of the film's success at helping to lift that veil of shame. Now, what is the, have you followed, have you followed the people since the movie? Oh, absolutely. We're friends with all of them. And we, you know, are you working on another documentary? We are working on another documentary, but I would prefer to talk about this No, I mean, I just wondered if you're... Not if on you're, this subject. Okay, no. that's what I'm But wondering. we're following the subject. Some of them are doing better. Mm -hmm. Some of them are in a similar situation. Obviously, the ones that started out closer to the higher end of middle class, it's easier for them to get back on their feet. Sure. Uh, because it's not just... Um, you know, your resources, it's your education, it's your contacts, and, um, you know, we are a very uh, socioeconomically separated society. How many people from one socioeconomic group hang out with people from another socioeconomic group? Um, it's, maybe in a small town it's different, but certainly in most uh, of America, um, you know, it's hard to be understanding when you don't really know what the other side's doing. And that's why I love doing screenings with United Ways around the country. Because United Way can gather everybody in town, from the people they serve, to the powers that be, to the business community, to the middle class. And that in itself, creating a screening in which there's a communal uh, uh, feeling, and the film itself is an emotional catharsis, creates an understanding both ways, both going down the socioeconomic ladder and going up. Sure. Absolutely. We are here with Harry Gantz. We're also here with Denise Manley. I want you to put this on the calendar if you don't already know about it. This evening, be there at the Art Center, 5.30. The film's going to start around 6. There'll even be a question and answer, and you'll get to talk to Harry Gantz right after the show. Hey, we'll be right back. Don't you go away. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? or a college tuition hung on a wall, or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box. Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Hey, I'm Ann Eller right here with you this afternoon. I tell you what, we're having a spirited conversation right here on WCRS. Hey, Harry, I know that you've been out doing screenings all over, and I know you had a tough time. I'm going to bring this up because a lot of my listeners are, uh, are Hannity listeners. You had a tough time with uh, Hannity, didn't you, when you were on, the, on that screening? Well, first of all, I appreciated the fact that uh, Sean Hannity saw the film. Right. And he was empathetic towards the people in the film, and he invited us on. Of course, we knew he was going to, you know, hijack the conversation and not let us talk about, uh, you know, the stories of the families. He got he basically played one clip in which um, one of the commentators in the film uh, talked about, you know, 
uh, you have to spend a little bit more money when uh, recessions happen in order to help people get back on their feet. And he just went into the diatribe about spending more money. We spend so much. Look at all we spend on the war on poverty. And it's not a success. There's more poor. Uh, well, you know, I didn't want to argue with him because it's his show. Um, he basically said the solution to unemployment in America is everybody needs to move to North Dakota because that's where all the jobs are. And you have to be willing to move. I said, well, everybody can't move to North, Carol uh, North, North Dakota. Uh, Dakota. John in the film has a sing single father with a... Down syndrome kid, and he has to stay in the state because the mother's also in the state. He said, No, John could move too if he really wanted to. So you're not going to argue with Sean Hannity. He gave it a lot of time. Hopefully, a lot of people saw it. And the important part is, is that people on both sides of the aisle are looking at this as our number one issue. And if he can help, along with people on both sides of the aisle, to create the will to make this our number one issue and look at it the same way America looked at World War II, the same way America looked at getting to the moon, if we can look at restoring the middle class and have the will to do it, then so much more power to him. You know, if we don't restore the middle class, our economy is never going to recover. I mean, that's the bottom line. We have to put people back to work. We have to give them the skills. We have to make sure there are the jobs. We have to make it so employers feel that they can hire people and not be penalized by the government. I think those are some of the issues that need to be addressed because if we don't get people back to work, all the rest is going to fall apart. We need taxpayers. You know, <laughs> the only way you have taxpayers is to have people working. Absolutely. I'm with you. So I certainly hope it becomes a subject where there is some lenience, even the tax code, even the tax code is a problem in our country. I mean, we can talk all day long about who pays what and all this type of thing, but the tax code, when you compare it against other countries, is a problem. But we're not here to talk politics, per se. We are here, though, to talk about what we can do about this. And, Denise, what was your, why did you want Harry Gantz to come here? Well, well I, um, I had did my research on Harry and, and, and saw the trailer, mm -hmm. um, and the trailer intrigued me, um, as it, I'm sure it will intrigue most people um, when they see it. And then I had the opportunity to watch, um, mm -hmm. and it, it was just an issue, of course, that's close to my heart with United Way and our United Center, because since the recession, we have seen the face of poverty change. Um, we have seen you know, those coming into our office seeking assistance who have never been there before, who never thought they would be there before, who did not want to be there. Um, and I personally want to make sure that assistance is there for them. I want to, because I, I saw that if they, we could just help them out, they will be back to where they were or on the road to back to where they were. And you know what the great thing about that is? If somebody receives assistance who, number one, never really wanted it and everything, they are more than willing when they get back on their feet to help and, and see the importance to give back. Oh, and you I can't imagine how many food pantries I've been to where the folks have told me, well, we had people who last year were contributing and pulling up in their Mercedes, and this year they're here looking for help. Sure. And when they get back on their feet, they will be right back there contributing. Now, what are you hoping comes out of this, Denise? With the screening here tonight and Harry here, what are you hoping that people are going to get? What What is the end goal here? Well, I would say that our United Way has really been uh, very proactive on the financial st um, stability initiative. Um, United Ways across America, our three impact areas are education, health, and income, or financial stability, whichever term you like to use. And I would say that our United Way has really done more in the financial stability arena than we have any of our impact areas. Um, the first being that when we moved into the United Center, um, that did attract more people to come to our building that needed assistance because they could seek, find the services all under one roof. But that also opened our eyes to say, you know, what, what can we do instead of just giving them a food voucher and sending them on their way, what can we do to help them long term? Um, we were able to write a grant for a case management. Um, we brought that program into the United Center, and then from that, our financial stability initiatives just grew and grew. When I saw the American Winter, I said, we have to bring that to the community to begin the conversation so that people can then begin to collaborate, say, we have got to work together to help this, this sector of people so that we can, you know, improve our economy. We've got, so this really, our goal is just to begin the conversation to open the eyes of maybe people that don't realize it, 
you know, I think sometimes I, I don't understand why people can't see it, but then I realize I see it every day. And, and, and because I... Well, people, you know, in truth, I don't think people don't want to see this, do they? Do no, they, they don't really want to see want it. To see this? They don't want to see it. They don't want to admit it. But if you if you begin to have the conversation with them and you and you say, if we could work together to improve it, um, that their eyes begin to open and, you know, they begin to think, okay, you know, this is, there is something that I can do. There's something that I can contribute, that I can have a part in. And they can see that it will benefit our whole community. You know, I think one of the one of the programs that you have at United Way that is so good is the uh, free tax help. Yes. You know, that program right there gives people who are getting money back that are, are uh, able to see and you try to put them on a financial path at that point to try to put them in the right direction rather than going out and just, I'll use the word, blowing the money. It is. It's our, it's our VITA program, our Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Um, IRS partners with United Ways to bring this free tax preparation and people think that is so funny. I have to say it because my husband is a CPA. Um, and so actually his his firm actually comes and does the tax law training with our, our VITA volunteers. So, um, it is about There's no relationship at all no, to it though about no. Okay. But it ahead, is please. it is more than just about filling out their their income, you know, their tax for four, free. Yeah. Um, it's about saying, okay, you're gonna get this two, three, four thousand dollar refund. What can sure. we do? to help you long term so that 30 days, 60 days from now, you're not coming back to the office going, I need food. And what can we do to help you on the road? Sure. Um, to help and I, that, that's that's why I think that's a great program there that you've been able to do. And you've been able to grow that program tremendously. Tremendously. Yes. From 35 tax preparations that we did the very first year to last year, 2,142 tax returns. Isn't that amazing, Harry? It is amazing. And you know, for those of your listeners, you talked about the tax code. Um, for those of your listeners who feel like it isn't the government's job to be in this business, you have an incredible alternative. You have the United Way and the United Center. And if you don't want your tax dollars to go for it, but you still have empathy for people in that situation, this is your outlet, locally and nationally. Support those organizations who are doing the work. And they're not only doing the work to help feed people, but you know it's the old story, teach a man to fish or sure. you, you give him a fish. Well, they're doing both of them. And um, you know it's such a valuable resource, and it transcends the divisiveness around taxes and politics because they are just there to serve their community, and whatever they do is going to make your life better, whether you're in that situation or not. The, the extra money that they get from that tax uh, return is going to be spent in your own community. Exactly, exactly. And I think we should always remember, there for the grace of God, go I. Exactly. There you go. Hey, I'm Ann Eller. I'm here with Harry Gantz. We are talking about um, American Winter in America. Where? What's the name of this film now? American Winter. American Winter. There you go. I'm here with Harry Gantz, and I'm here with Denise Manley. We're going to take a little quick uh, word from our sponsors that make all this possible, and we'll be right back. All right. We're right back here. Gosh, time is flying by when you're having a good time. Harry Gantz, I, I got to tell you, you, you were just telling us how uh, what a journey you're on with the screenings that you're seeing. You've been at different places, and uh, what's been happening? What have you been finding out? Well, um, what inspires me most is that um, no matter what the problems are around poverty, there are people in every community who sometimes just on their own initiative find a way to make a difference. Um, from large organizations to small. And I just like to continually give examples because I'm so impressed. Uh, I, I talked about an organization at lunch today called Circles, which is like a, um, it's like a big brother or big sister for families. So these are middle or upper middle class families who essentially adopt a working class family. And they are their contacts, they're their mentors. You know, the education goes both ways. Sure. Um, but they are their um, basically guides to help them get back into the middle class. And that relationship basically never ends. Do you think we have a middle class today here? Well, we certainly don't have a middle class that we had, you know, when I was growing up in the 60s and the 70s, where, um, you know, you pretty much sure if you got a decent manufacturing job uh, or you got a, a, a job that paid a, a living wage, prices were lower, um, families were together, and um, you felt like, like when I did, when I graduated from college, from a, a mixed race and a mixed socioeconomic high school, 
all of us felt in 1976 that if we did the right thing, if we worked hard and we got an education, that we could succeed. And I have an 18-year-old who I just sent off to college this year, and I would not say that that is the same attitude of her and her friends. They're worried about taking out all this debt, and then will they even be able to get a job in which they can service their debt and live a, a decent life? And, um, you know, and that's the, what the we're American trying to The American dream of the, of the home and, and, and the, the picket fence and the dog and the cat and all this, it, it's really something that is disappearing. It is disappearing. And, and that's very sad for our country. And it is our responsibility because I'm 56 years old. We gave this to their children, and it's our responsibility in the next 20 years, along with the new generation, to restore the middle class to so the glory that it was in the 60s and the 50s and the beginning of the 70s. Yeah, exactly. I, I you know, I, I think that is, and when you talk to uh, millennials, you know, one of the big surveys they just had out here, millennials don't want credit cards because, because they're afraid of having any debt because they already have debt from school, number one, but that means when they go to buy a car or they want to buy a home, they don't have any credit. So they're really putting themselves in a jam. And I was so amazed to hear, because we always hear about college kids and credit cards, right? I was so amazed to hear that. But in the, in the larger scale of things, no, they don't want credit cards. Yeah. They, they may get a prepaid card, but they don't want one that allows them to charge beyond their what, what is on it. But uh, Well, I guess they've learned a lesson from this great recession. and I. I prefer that they're afraid of debt than they're uh, abusing debt. So um, uh, I think from that, from that standpoint, but it is a shame that they are so scared to death that they would not do this type of thing. That's right. And if you don't take that risk and take on a little uh, credit, uh, you never are able to buy a car or a house. Sure. So um, we're talking about the the documentary American Winter. If you are able to be there, you should put it on your calendar. Now I know tonight is church night. But I think that you would be forgiven if you went to this. I think, actually, that they would say you did a good thing. Would you think that, Denise? Oh, I certainly agree. I don't, I, you know, that's, it's your choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting it out there, Denise. Um, Invite your minister to come along with you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Exactly. We have but, reached out to our, our partner churches that, that do some missional work with us, and we have invited them to invite their congregation, so anybody is uh, welcome at 530. And certainly uh, religion has a lot to, to a big role to play in this uh, movement to help restore the middle class, because every religion has the same, a similar mandate to help those less fortunate, and it, uh, you know, it, it transcends the divisiveness of politics, Absolutely. and it comes to it from a, a spiritual and a humanitarian basis. And um, so we appreciate the work that churches have done in this great recession and call on them to help us in this mission. Absolutely. You know, United Ministry came together because of a group of churches coming together. And, of course, that's another organization. Actually, when you look at Greenwood, we are very blessed with the different organizations we have. We have United Way, we have United Ministry, we have the Salvation Army, plus a lot of other organizations that are out there doing good work. And I, I would say that in the last um, couple of years, I've seen more collaboration amongst these um, these nonprofits to work together to serve those that need because the need is so the great. need is so great, and, and you know we're having to stretch our resources. So it's uh, it would be an excellent thing for you to be there this evening. The uh, 530, 530 to six is going to be kind of a quick meet and greet, and then at six o'clock the movie American Winter. It is at the Federal Building. Certainly, certainly hope that you will take the time to go there. I know there's a lot of other things to do out there, but you will appreciate it, and maybe it will open your eyes to something that you haven't seen before and you can uh, relate to. You know, we were talking earlier, Harry, about empathy and um, the relationship to empathy. Everybody wants to empathize. So let's just discuss that when we're talking about American Winter. Well, certainly, um, you know, American winter and the voices that children uh, generate empathy in people, and uh, there's usually not a dry eye in the house at the end of the uh, at the end of the screen. But um, empathy almost has a it, it kind of rhymes with sympathy, and I think that's really the wrong way to look at this. I think um, you know, as a filmmaker, what has driven me is a curiosity and an interest in other people. And you know, the great thing about a small town is you run into a lot of people you know. And uh, you can see things from their point of view because some of them you've known their whole life. And um, that's a great advantage. And that probably has something to do why why the United Way is so successful here. 
but you know, I always say that we could make an interesting documentary about anybody. So um, I don't feel sorry for people that are in a bad situation. Um, I feel like, what can we all do to help them get back on their feet, and how can I help them tell their story? And I'm just interested in them. There's people who are like that all the time, and that's the mind of a documentary filmmaker. Curiosity killed the cat, but it also allowed us to feel and hear people's stories in a way that we wouldn't have without it. Absolutely. Well, you know, uh, you certainly have touched a lot of people doing this documentary, and, you know, I, I was thinking about doing it in Portland, Oregon. It's cold there, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, not Minnesota, Minnesota cold, cold, but it's, it's cold. cold. Yeah, and you're, you're dealing with uh, a lot of really tragedy in that situation, and I just, uh, you know, I, I often think about one of the worst areas of poverty. We used to do uh, lots of Christmas uh, help a family for Christmas and one of the hardest things that I ever saw and this was back in the mid 90s was wear shoals and the poverty that is up in wear shoals and I'll never forget going to a house and here we were all excited about delivering Christmas and one of the gifts that the children wanted was a bag of lemons and I was like okay lemons we'll buy lemons no problem we drove up in the car and we popped open the trunk and the first thing the child looked at and said, oh, there's lemons. And so I gave him the lemons, and then we started unloading the car and taking it inside. And the adult there said, uh, don't step on that rug, don't step on that rug, the dog will pop up from underneath the house. And there were holes in the floor, and the dog popped up underneath the house. Now, this is in our area. This is in our community. Where Shoals? Yeah, that's right. And then there was a toilet sitting in the middle of the floor. And that, that was a big one room, and there was a toilet sitting in the middle of the floor. And we walked out of that house, and I said, you know, I don't know if I can do this again. Because it was so, it was right there at Christmas. You thought you had done something good, and we had done something good. We had done something wonderful by taking these things. But it made you feel so bad to know that right here in our area are things like this. And it's... It's, it's everywhere, but in, in Greenwood County, you wouldn't think you would have that, but we do. And because of places like United Way, there is hope even for those people. Imagine what a social service worker is like in Los Angeles. Have you ever seen photographs or films of Skid Row, the largest homeless population in the country? You look at that problem and you think, how am I ever going to solve this? It's so massive. There's so much suffering. And it's hard to even look at the, you know, sort of training it takes to get somebody into the job market when there is so much poverty. So, um, you know, I think big cities can learn something from the communities like Greenwood, where um, the entire community rallies around this. The will is already here. Sure. And what I'm taking away from it is trying to bring the kind of will and community involvement where people from all walks of life, business, social services, the radio station gets behind the idea of helping those less fortunate and puts it as our number one priority. So thank you for giving me that lesson. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, I think the other thing, uh, Denise, that we don't realize that nobody ever thinks that we have in Greenwood is homeless people. That is true. Uh, and we do have homeless people. Right, we Because do. there are so many different classifications of homeless. Um, there are multiple families living under one roof. There is um, that single mom who can't afford, so she's staying at a friend's house. There are so many different ways to look at homelessness, and we do have that problem. Now, we are very fortunate that in the last few years we've had the pathway house and the shelter. Um, but even with the pathway house, it, they are a cold weather shelter, which now they have gone year round for their men's facility. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Go ahead, Denise. I just needed to say that. Uh, but now they have gone one step further, and United Way and the Pathway House, we partnered together for a program called Furnishing Your Future, which is teaching these men a skill, teaching these men um, a, a, a furniture refinishing skill so that the, they can then go out and become employed, um, maybe with a contractor or, or with so a So they're skill. learning to fish. Is that what you're they're telling me? To fish. Yeah, they're absolutely. learning to fish while we're also meeting their need of being homeless and providing a, a roof over their head for the night. Absolutely. Well, if you want to go to uh, an, an inspiring um, film this evening, you should be there at the Federal Building. American Winner is the film. One is produced and directed by uh, your brother Joe. We didn't really mention Joe, but Harry's here. 
that's right. And uh, you've won many awards, and we appreciate you spending the time with us and coming to Greenwood to talk about this issue. Harry Gantz, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. This is WCRS. Remember, 5.30 tonight. You've got just enough time to uh, get home and get over there to the film. That's the beauty of Greenwood. It's all closed. Uptown Greenwood at the Federal Building, 5.30. If you don't meet that, be there by 6 o'clock so you can see the film, and you'll be glad you did. Bye-bye, everybody.